So hello, everyone. Welcome back to the 2023 Treating the Whole Person Optimizing Wellness Conference. I'm Alexis Johnson. And I'm the social media manager here at RSDSA. I'm joined by Jim Broach, Executive Vice President and Director of RSDSA, and our final 2023 virtual conference speakers, Dr. Stefan Cortez and Dr. Allison Varley. Dr. Cortez and Dr. Varley are investigators behind the world's only study to directly examine suicides that happen after prescription opioid reduction or stoppage. Both researchers developed ethical concern after seeing that the downturn in U.S. opioid prescribing adversely affected patients with pain. Dr. Cortez has led in several advocacy efforts to mitigate these traumatic changes to care. Both Dr. Varley and Dr. Cortez also recognize that many healthcare agencies would not alter their policies without detailed study of individual deaths. Tonight's presentation uh, will introduce why their study needs to be done, how it is being done, and how people from our community can join the effort. Now, as always, remember that while the information shared here tonight is helpful, please consult your physician for personalized medical advice. And now before I turn it over to our guest, Jim, I know today's been a big day in the CRPS community. You wanna to touch on a little bit of the current events? I think it's it's an amazing blessing for the Kalowski family that there, I think with punitive damages, it's, it's like $250 million and that I, I, it's a great victory for CRPS and I really hope it really increases the awareness of this rare devastating disease. And I'm so excited tonight for the last, since 2016, we've been, this community has been bedeviled by the CDC guidelines and we've lost so many. And I'm so glad that we're focusing on the dire consequences of this misguided policy that's still occurring. And let's go. Definitely. So we will turn it over to our special guests. And of course, please leave any questions that you have in the chat. Hi, um, I'm Stefan Kertes, and I'm here with Allison Varley. Hi, Allison. Hi, everyone. I have no idea why my face is very slightly blurry at this <laughs> moment. I can't figure it out. Um, but there you have it. Um, we're going to start a uh, screen share to show some slides to talk about our our, our study, which will uh, reduce my anxiety about the fact that I'm currently blurry. Um, this is, uh, yeah, this should be up. And I just need to start the little show. But basically, we're going to describe a study. We're doing it for more than one reason. Um, Allison, is it the right screen showing? Um, we can see your slide. It's not the presentation, but the slides with the um, part on the side. So okay, maybe it, not. I switched it. Did it change? No. Okay. So we got to change, share in a different way. Now switch it. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about a study that is um, ongoing and where the, the one of the main issues that is so important is to find and learn about the families that have potential interest and participation. Um, this The need to profile and understand and prevent suicides that have happened for some after prescription opioid reductions, that need existed eight years ago. And um, the this, this study is in a way much later than I would want. It's just that's how long it took us to get an actual funder. And of course, we did a lot of advocacy in the in the period that it wasn't funded and also some other types of research. But that's nonetheless key and obvious to us that this data is still needed now and that without information about these losses that have occurred, we may not uh, ever sway our healthcare system, our payers, our providers, to alter course. So we're gonna introduce the study and then we really do want to ask you both what questions you have, what mistakes you think we're making, which we're always open to hearing about, and whether you know of people uh, who will give you QR codes where you could share information about the study with others. And we can provide a handout as well, one pager 
for anybody who suffered this terrible, devastating loss uh, who might want to be interviewed. The team for our study, I should have said first, our study presenting with me is Dr. Allison Varley, an implementation health scientist and health behavior scientist. The photo is part of our team in Birmingham, Alabama, but we have collaborators everywhere. Um, it took a while to assemble this team. Uh, I want to highlight, uh, you know, a lot of us in Birmingham are on that left column, but at the very bottom is Adam Gordon. He's actually an addiction doctor, has been one of the champions of helping us get the study launched. And then middle in the second column at the top, Dr. Thomas Joyner from Florida State University is one of the world's leading suicidologists. That means that his entire profession is trying to understand how and why and what are the circumstances around suicide. Near the bottom of that second column, you see Anne Fuqua. Anne is a patient with long-term pain who I met here in Birmingham, first met on Twitter though, and she lives nearby, but she was tracking the social media mentions of people who had long-term pain and had had prescription opioids reduced or stopped and then had a death or a medical event and drew my attention to why this was so important. And in that, you know, on the third column, you see Cassania Sloan so Richardson, one of our advisors who actually sued on behalf of her, the loss of her, uh, her partner uh, and, and won, a prop to our knowledge, the only case where somebody won. Don Gibson is a disability advocate. Uh, there are also veterans advocates and uh, Kate Nicholson in the lower right from the National Pain Advocacy Center. A study like this required all these partners, partly because we need their wisdom and their intelligence, but also to convince somebody to fund it. So this briefing, we're gonna talk about opioid prescription reduction, a little bit of the data that exists. I'm gonna tell you the limitations on that data because it's, um, it's not the kind of data we seek. Um, suicide does have federal and our attention. Um, and we're gonna talk about the design of our study and then some of our advocacy. There's research that provides signals of the, you take a big giant database where all the researchers can see is what medicines people got, when those medicines might've changed, and a little bit about their age, maybe their gender, maybe some diagnoses, maybe not. And then they, they just do statistics. And there's these studies like this one, the Veterans Administration study that showed that discontinuation in veterans in data that was seven years old, 10 years old now, seemed to be followed by an elevated rate of suicide and death. It controlled for, it considered, the data could consider diagnoses that were actually recorded in the records of people, but the data could not show what was going on, whether the person was destabilizing or having serious problems before the prescription opioids were stopped. Uh, there's an Oregon Medicaid study like that, which again, shows a kind of event. It, can, it doesn't need to be a, a death event. It could be a going to a hospital and saying that one felt like dying by suicide. And they show again, some increased rate of this suicidal event um, in people who had opioids reduced or stopped, but they don't know why. There's a couple of papers that are from national commercial Medicare data that they also show a hint of something that goes wrong when doses are reduced. Not all studies show something um, as disturbing as, the, as these, but this is enough that it led the Food and Drug Administration to issue a cautionary statement based on the VA study alone, basically in 2019 to say, hey, be careful, except they didn't know what to tell people to do. Um, overdose also, I meant to show that to you. There are also signals of overdose being often more frequent after a dose reduction. I don't think it's crucial to, sh to iterate through the details about every study. And I'm not saying that every reduction causes overdose or every reduction causes suicide because there are people who say afterwards, you know, the reduction I underwent helped me. And there are people who feel better. Um, people are complicated. These statistical studies are kind of limited because no one ever asks what happened? Why? Why did this happen? Because to really ask what happened to a person, you kind of have to look at the story of that person and not just at some gigantic abstract database. Quantitative data is only partly actionable. It's not really clear that um, 
slower reductions in prescribed opioids prevent a bad outcome. Sometimes a slow reduction is also a bad outcome. Sometimes it's good. At some human level, none of the data I've described show us what happened. So we were kind of inspired by Anne Fuqua because she was collecting these reports and that meant that there were people out there who were saying something happened, we're concerned about it, it matters. And um, we decided, okay, let's try to follow up, but we can't, she has a private list and Maya Salovitz even wrote about it in New York Times, January 3rd, 2023. It's a hundreds of mentions of different kinds of events, including suicides. So in this photo, you see it was the stage to look a little bit like the Last Supper or something. And it's kind of speaking to part of our team and it's very staged, but we can't raid a private list. Um, as a research team working out of a university in a VA hospital with an ethics review, we can't take someone's private list and go tap the shoulders of the people who are lost. We, we have to set up a structure where people come to us if they wish to. Now, as I said, I tried to make this clear and I appreciate Allison for helping us with this slide because the study itself took a long time to set up and I'll describe how it works. We did start out by speaking to the public and I um, ruffled a lot of feathers. Allison helped me do that. We went, you see in the look lower right, we actually made a trip to the CDC and went right in the building. <laughs> said there needs to be a clarification of this 2016 guideline, which is playing out very poorly. Uh, I have you know, more than a few op opinion pieces out there, uh, more than a few colleagues uh, who have said that we're saying the wrong things by drawing attention to what we felt was terrible harm being done to patients. And um, I just wanted you to know that we've been writing and speaking and that, that piece, it's called Editorial New Data on Opioid Dose Reduction. It's from a medical journal, and it's in a journal called JAMA o Network Open, and it that's open, meaning it's not behind a paywall. So that might be interesting to people because it looks at a scientific study, but we make an ethical case that if you don't know something that's going to help someone or hurt them, you should do it with their consent and not without their consent. The study that we're doing, CSI Opioids, which stands for Contexts of Suicidal Ideation and Completion Following Opioid Transitions, has two funded aims. One is to characterize the patient and the context factors, which I'll explain, associated with suicide among 110 to 115 people uh, who died by suicide in the context of prescription opioid reduction. And the other is to identify factors that might differ between those deaths that occur among veterans and those among non-veterans. Uh, we would like one day to look at the overdoses too. We just don't have that set up yet and we don't have the funding. We received funding from the VA, but this is a rare study where we were explicitly given advance authorization to include anybody from the United States, whether the person who died was a veteran or not, whether they used the VA or not. Uh, all of that's considered informative. And the question people sometimes ask is, why do you want to look at individual cases? Why can't you run the numbers? And the way I like to explain it is with this example of an airplane crash. In 1996, a really significant crash occurred. All crashes are significant, but this one drew attention because there was controversy about why it happened. TWA Flight 800 took off from JFK, New York, and crashed just a few minutes after taking off. And people thought they saw a missile or a trail of light going toward the airplane. Maybe it was terrorism. Two, and 230 people died. And there was disputes between federal agencies about what happened and how to explore it and who should take charge. But ultimately the value uh, lay in the case investigation and they reassembled all the parts of the plane they could find. And they drew in all the experts they could to look at that one crash. And they came up with the recognition that something unique and unexpected had happened, which was there was an ignition of a flammable combination of fuel and air in a hot and mostly empty tank and a wing. And that was highly subject to explosion with just a very, very small amount of heat or spark. And they changed the rules to prevent that from happening again. And that's the case we make when we speak to anybody, uh, funders, the CDC, that we need to look at individual losses. It is true that part of it is to understand why to prevent them. But I also believe that one of the things that's important about looking at individual losses is to make sure people understand that every death is a tragedy. And these are not just numbers and they're not just statistics, um, but these are real people. Um, and so far 
we need a lot more people to take this seriously. The technique we use for a case examination is called psychological autopsy, which means it's like an autopsy, except we're not examining a body the way I did as a medical student. Uh, and this kind of technique has existed since the 1960s. And it's often used by medical examiner's offices when they're studying whether somebody died by suicide or they look at all the suicides in a given area, a uh, province of China or New York City or Los Angeles. Um, and we are sort of doing something in that tradition, but it's also different for ways I'll explain. Now, when we try to look at suicide, we are thinking about it as a complex event. It's not just the change in the prescription medicines. It is an event that only some people are going to have happen, even if they don't feel good. And this is a model that some people use for looking at um, suicide, which considers the society, the community, the organization where they get their care, maybe, um, their insurance, which is kind of an organizational thing, interpersonal factors, relationships they have, whether they feel like they belong to other people, whether they feel like they're a burden to other people, um, whether they're isolated, whether they're supported, whether those relationships they have are stable. And individual things like their pain, their pain and their medical status, their psychological status. And you try to, we want to collect information that pertains to all these things. And there's questions we can ask by carrying out an interview and where possible getting medical records. How many of the people who died had a rapid or a slow opioid taper? They won't all be because it was rapid. Was there a hint of potential for self-harm before or after? How many declared a, a concern to others? Uh, risk factors, what about perceived burdensomeness or thwarted belongingness? Those are psychological concepts. You feel like you're a burden to others. You feel like you don't belong to others. Um, what healthcare contacts took place before the suicide? Um, did healthcare have a conflict or an impasse in care? Was there possession of a way to die? And for veterans, how many went into the VA or went out of it? The way we're doing our study, this is a very simplified overview, and it is outreach, uh, screeners, um, which is an online survey where people can be screened to see if they the event they're describing seems like it was a suicide that happened probably after a prescription opioid medication reduction. And then for people who consent, we, we bring them in for, uh, we do a detailed interview after their consent over electronic means, usually teams. We could do it other ways. And then if they have authority, we work with a separate team from the university to solicit medical records if they can sign for that. That's not always possible. And then we're going to create a synthetic story. Originally, when we started just trying to prove that we could do this, we created a advertisement of our own, which was a set of social media ad that said, have you lost someone with pain to suicide? And the screening survey is still live and it's still live and still being used now. Uh, we're not using this ad at this moment, although we could still post it if we want, but we're preparing a media campaign to reach out to the American public basically on social media. Um, this particular one doesn't imply that people died because opioids were taken away. It just says, is it someone with pain who died? And then within that, um, it, it allows people to know our mission, which is to prevent these deaths from happening. The challenge that we face is gigantic, which is that there's not a registry. There's not a, um, there's not a single place where these losses are recorded. Uh, and if there was, it's not clear we could approach the people who survived and ask them for their participation because they haven't consented to that. So we are basically reaching out to the public and people in the public are reasonably skeptical of researchers, particularly researchers touching on opioids, many of whom have made great careers for themselves, but not necessarily um, offered a really careful thought on how to take care of people. And then if you do the this work, we have to be prepared for people who are alive to say, hey, I'm having my medications reduced. I'm suffering. I don't know what to do. Or, I have a friend who's having this happen. Your study seems to be designed to help after we're dead, which is really a concern. We don't have the answer, right? We want policies to change, but 
it is an ethical obligation to have some kind of response to that in case people do reach out to us, or if you know somebody who's dealing with this. So separate from our studies website, I drafted a guide for families that is on medium.com in my name saying, my doctor has to says they have to lower my long-term opioid medicine. What can I do? What do I say? And it includes things about how to have a conversation, how to think about it. It includes a statement that not all reductions are bad, but it then goes through all the action steps you could consider based on that crisis. So we're waiting on our beloved contracting officers to issue the contract to an outfit that will help spread the word commercially um, because we need people who've suffered this loss to consider collaboration with us. We uh, have an organization that will work with us to some extent to find military families who've lost someone. And then we are giving talks everywhere we go, including this one, to try to get the word out in as many channels as possible. And if people want to suggest channels that would be helpful, we're, we're interested. Just so you know what happens when somebody answers our survey, there's an eligibility screener and there's 43 questions. So there's quite, no, it's, there's a, it's a it's protected information. It's housed on a university server that's been uh, tested for all kinds of security, but it's the person who's reporting is talking about someone they've lost. And we basically ask those people a number of things about themselves and about the person who died. But also we ask to the best of your knowledge, did the person who died experience any of the following changes in opioid pain medicine? And it includes reduced, stopped, increased, changed in some other way. I don't know. And then there's free text. They can write in whatever they think happened. And there's a question of how confident are you that the death was an intentional act of suicide? And people can answer all the way. Like, I don't know for sure. That's okay to answer that. And then we look through and adjudicate based on the responses, including the free text, uh, who seems to be describing what's likely an event of interest. And then we invite them to participate further. If they do participate further, there's actually modest payment um, that's approved by the Institutional Review Board for their time. I think it's like a, a debit card of $100 and then something like that, $50 if they help with the records, but they don't all have authority to get records. To date, um, 52 people have screened and qualified a number of the people who initially responded to us in 2020, 21, when we were still trying to get an actual fund base for the study, those are now old uh, responses that we haven't been able to reach back, get those people to come back to us. So they're a little bit stale. We've, in, we've done six interviews. We're scheduling four more. Um, the, we're stuck with a federal contracting office. You think the federal government spends a boatload of money, but when you want to spend $60,000 for a research study, you have to argue for that money to go out the door, which is what I'm doing. And for people who are in the interviews, um, the questions we ask, if they proceed, are, about, are not leading questions. There's questions about general health. Uh, do you think the suicide was related to a specific problem or event? What was it? Um, we ask about pain. We ask about health care. We ask about social support. We, we're trying to build a rich understanding, not a narrow one of what really happened. Some of the themes from our interviews that have come through so far, um, people have described having multiple pain doctors, uh, previous suicide attempts in some instances, not all, uh, mention of suicide in conversations, uh, people who had an active lifestyle and then personalities that were outgoing prior to the dose reduction, histories of trauma in childhood, uh, family history of mental illness, uh, emergency department visits, uh, geographic moves, stress, financial stress, addiction, dependence, family, and burdensomeness. Um, I don't want to, I want to skip this and I'm, I'm going to show you uh, this. So if you take a screenshot, <laughs> those are the QR codes to, to find our study. Um, there's a general study webpage at csiopioids.org, which is the link on the left. It, it's actually hard to enter the study from the general study webpage. It mostly is just to explain who we are. And then there's a screening survey, which is the middle one, but you, you can find it from the general study webpage. And then there's a one page information sheet you can share with anybody. And um, we would be glad to share it. And Allison, I wanted to ask if you'd like to comment on where we are at or what you think would help 
before we take questions and answers? Yeah, I mean, I think you've presented the information pretty well. You know, we are actively uh, trying to recruit family members that could participate or family members or friends that could participate in this study. We love feedback on, you know, any of the content that we've presented, but also, you know, ways that we can get the word out about the study too. And, you know, ideas for future study as well. We are in this odd space of doing this on Zoom, but we know it's cast elsewhere. So we'll be curious about questions that may have come in and, and how, where they, where the people are. Are they on Facebook or, or YouTube? I'm sorry I'm blurry. I really don't know why I am either. It's very frustrating. No, you look great. <laughs> Do I look well, blurry? I, my question is, is it just in the United States? Because there's a lot of different communities across the world. The study is currently approved for assessment of people who died, who were in the U.S. citizens who died. Okay. We have not mastered the ethics and the approvals that we need to get to assess deaths outside of the United States. I'm very aware this is a fairly live issue elsewhere, especially Canada. And I, um, I think it's hard to explain how many weird regulations we had to overcome to set this up. Um, and so I, I want to look at Canada, but I don't know, know how, how many lawyers I need to approve us to do right. it. <laughs> and they never give you a straight answer. Yeah. And, and Canada is so important because if people are going there to die with the euthanasia. I'm, I'm certainly interested in that. Um, I know they have permission, you know, to, to do that there. And to your knowledge, are there people who have essentially been abandoned in the United States and have kind of said, okay, my next stop is Canada. I, I've heard, I've, I've seen the intention. I have not seen the completed act, but I'm, it's something I'm greatly concerned about. Yeah. Yeah. I think most of the questions that we have, people were trying to make sure that they had the correct link. So I did put the link in the chat, the csiopioids.org, and then the longer link for the screening survey. I did go ahead and put those in the chat as well on and both I'm, channels. So, uh, I'm going to, and I'm typing out like the version that I typed into the Zoom chat. I hope you'll share if you didn't yeah. share that because it's, it isn't crazy complicated if you don't have the QR code. It's go. Mm -hmm go, well, HTTPS colon slash slash, go.uab.edu. So University of Alabama, Birmingham, go Blazers. We're not the ones with the Crimson Tide. Go uab.edu slash CSI opioids. And then for the general study explanation, you can find it. You can find the way into the study there at csiopioids.org. We bought the, the domain. And um, we're trying to put up, we're trying to keep it fresh and put up new information. Um, uh, there's a lot there's of a lot. people on the study who are frustrated with how patients with pain have been treated. Absolutely. Any other questions that you have, Jim? I, no, I think that, that basically what we can do is really broadcast this into our communities and ask them to keep on sharing it. Because so often some, some of the good social media for uh, places for people with CRPS, we might not even know. And so I, I think that's that's real important. But um, I, I just want to thank you for your advocacy. I've been following your your work for years and, and it's it's been fabulous. And the fact that you're doing this is just warms our hearts. You know, I wanted to share with you. It, it's so strange, but Allison is the one who said we could study this um, and, and that I kept saying I was outraged that we needed to look at these individual deaths. And she's the one who said, we actually can. Um, you just need to kind of pick up, pick up yourself and, and go try to make it happen. Now, we've learned over time that there were people who did not want this studied. And that's one of the things that people need to understand is like part of the reason we're so it's hard. It's just clearly hard. We can't we can't make families come to us. We just have to show ourselves to be humane. But when I, when I first suggested at a national meeting 
that we must study these losses. It was, it was somebody came back and said, no, you must not. <laughs> and I mean, that was a pretty stunning argument to make that a death doesn't merit being studied. Um, I'm trying to think if I can find it, I'll throw it into the chat and you can share it. But, you know, there really were people who were willing to say, please don't look at how people die. Is the IT there, I found the link. I'm going to put it in the chat. And I, I mean, I was aghast. I'd never heard of that in medicine. Um, but this has been a tough area to work in. Yeah. Well, also about um, when I was thinking about your talk tonight, I was thinking about what about family members, too? Because I know there's been at least one instance where a couple went together after he was uh, denied opiate medicine. So I think you're talking about a kind of secondary suicide, like another person in the same family. Exactly. We don't, we don't have a language for it. Um, I don't, we don't have a, a, a an approved protocol to look at those. We don't mm -hmm. have a plan. Um, I think it's pretty important because I think you're, like what's happening is you're describing kind of if you each person lives in a network or a web of others. And if you if you take one down, it's not shocking that it's going to affect others. Other people are going to be affected in ways that are adverse to them. And that might be the last draw for them. So when you know, it's so strange because it's true that excessive opioid prescribing was a community and public health event. Uh, that meant other people could get the pills, a teenager could grab them, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But it's also a community event when you traumatize somebody who has complex chronic pain and disability, because there's a whole web of people around them whose lives yes. may depend on them or who, who are trying to take care of them, but who are now finding meaning and helping them. So as you, you know, otherize and devastate one individual, other people are caught in the in that same trap. So it's also a community event. You know, the National Pain Advocacy Center, their website emphasizes pain as a justice event, as a race, as a race concern, as a disability concern. It, it's not just what do we do about the pills and those people. It, it encompasses justice claims that affect us all and affect these family members. Now that said, we don't officially have a protocol to figure out how to study a second suicide. Yeah, that's amazing. I do have a just a general question um, that has come up in conversation. So what, in your opinion, what can pain patients, especially CRPS patients do, you know, um, to help their physicians or get their physicians to prescribe opioids? I mean, they just feel like they cannot get anything. How do they change it in their communities? Anything that they can do. I have a website where you wrote, um, yeah, he, sorry, he has a website where he kind of wrote up a guide for uh, navigating those discussions with your physicians that I think is uh, really insightful. I have put that in the chat and I don't, I'll share it just so people can see what's there. That I don't think it changes the community though, right? So I think your question gets at two things at once. One is how do I deal with my doctor? But the other is how do I deal with the fact that there's an overwhelming um, reaction going on amongst all doctors and amongst all clinicians that is like a social phenomenon, a stampede. And I got to admit, like, if you talk to sort of thought leaders, even pretty experienced pain and addiction people, they'll all say we overdid the reductions, but they are not on the front lines. They're not your primary care doctor. And there's a fair number of pain clinics have just said, oh, we overdid the reductions, but we're not touching those patients anymore, which is terrible. So if you're asking, how do we fix a now stampede phenomenon in which clinicians have all adopted groupthink? The answer is, I don't know exactly other than for patients to involve themselves with organizations like rsds.org, National Pain Advocacy Center, the Chronic Pain Association. Uh, I think I said the name wrong, just to be honest, but to go ahead and, and then to keep sending in letters whenever there's a request for public comments, but to go ahead, if you have energy, which is hard to pull, if you have energy, time or money to, to work with organizations that speak directly from the voice, that is no single research professor can capture that dynamic fully. Although Lord knows 
all the members of our team have tried. Um, I will show you for if you're stuck in the in the challenging situation, this I have a page for individual patients um, and families. It does mention our study right up front. And then it explains some ways to think about the reductions. And it's not all, I'm not, it says it could be helpful. It, it's not like it's always bad. What are the potential benefits of a dose reduction? It goes through that. What are the risks of a dose reduction? And we go through right that, all the stuff that I mentioned, some of which I didn't mention. What did the guidelines say? Um, and then we go through the guidelines technically. So that if your doctor says, well, I have to because of the guideline, which they sometimes say, you can say, well, no, no, actually the language in that guideline isn't that now, it's different. Um, here's a CDC screenshot condemning the misuse of their prior guideline and explaining that they don't want that to happen any further. So if a doctor, which they do, the often says, oh, a DEA made me do it or a CDC made me do it. You can at least say, can we have a conversation about that? Because I've read the guideline or I've read the sections that matter. And they don't say that. Um, okay, should I try to persuade my doctor that their dose reduction is wrong for me? How can we prepare for this conversation? And I try to even go through the words to use to not trigger your doctor's ego problems. I'm so sorry, you have to worry about that, by the way. Um, uh, <laughs> plan to take notes, that's important. And then it goes on through, unfortunately, to terrible, you know, the options of like, how do you argue? What words could you say? Right. Um, what, what, should I go on buprenorphine? <laughs> what about going to a methadone clinic? All of them. And, you know, like I was just at an addiction meeting. It's a particular style of addiction meeting called a MRSA that tend to be primary care people. They're all like, oh, yeah, of course we took off way too many people. That's obvious. That's a problem. Now our methadone clinics are filled with pain patients who shouldn't have been abandoned in the first place. Um, like, so... It, in one corner of the world, it's often a harm reduction corner, they're, they're very emphatic, like, Stefan, you're so right, you were right early. Um, it's terrible what's happened, but you could go to another section of the pain world or the addiction world and you hear, yeah, you know, every time we take a patient off opioids, uh, an angel gets its wings. Um, I think uh, two, two points. I, I really think we can't just talk about doctors. It's also nurse practitioners and it's physician assistants who were even more radical at times. And um, that I think that's in, that's real important. And I think uh, have, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I, I appreciate your saying that. I think, have you seen sort of, sort of overly simplistic things coming from non-physicians too? Yes. And, and then also the other thing too is uh, medical schools. I mean, what, you know, they hardly teach about pain anyways. And, and um, just it's they're over layered with this quote opiate epidemic. Yeah. You know um, so now I work with medical residents who trained in the last five years and they, they, they admit they're, they're afraid to prescribe um, the culture change happened. And in the inpatient setting, it's not as hard, you know, somebody's had surgery or whatever. Um, they're genuinely curious, but they're like, I've been told this is always bad. Um, there is an article that I wrote with Dr. Pooja Ligacetti. Pooja's from University of Michigan, and, and it's about, uh, it's, a, it's called harms versus harms. So it's about whether to continue or stop opioids. And you normally the CDC says, consider the benefits of the opioids and the risks. And Pooja got frustrated reading medical charts where the doctors write, there's no benefit because I read such and such a study. So there's no benefit, there's only risk. I already know this sort of closed mind, but that's where they got. And she said, I don't wanna talk about benefits anymore because I can't get anybody to discuss them rationally. So let's just talk about the harms of stopping versus the harms of continuing. <laughs> um... And, and so the piece actually plays it out as, okay, if you have a patient already on them, which is not going to help, or it doesn't really help the conversation for people who are not on them. But if you do, how would you, um, you know, how could you discuss without getting into a giant fight about benefit? How could you help that person anyway? Right. Um, just for people to know in the YouTube chat, I've put the connection to the, um, the link to the article. 
uh, on what to do if your doctor is stopping them. And the other thing I'll mention is that there's a podcast that I do with a friend of mine named Saul, and we have several episodes on opioids and on even on suicide and opioids. And mostly we're talking about trying to establish caring and reflective conversations. And we don't think the medical profession, and I think that now you're saying maybe not also, also not nurse practitioners and physician assistants, we often objectify or close ourselves off from the people that we're supposed to be helping. And the issue is that that is not helpful and that does not lead to open and frank conversations. Yeah. Um, I think yeah, the magic yeah. word uh, that, that Dr. Darnell always talks about is voluntary tapering. And yeah. I think that's you know, so important. And the other thing that just in our community, what's happening now is that especially anesthesiologists are demanding that you do procedures and they don't want to do medication management. And it's, there's a lot of profiteering. Yeah. Um, it's true that, and I take care of people who have been on long-term high dose um, opioids or at least medium dose opioids. It can be difficult. I have people who have complex disabilities and sometimes it seems like the medicine is the problem. Sometimes it seems like there's other things going on in their life. So it's true that the payment for the health professions is not high for the work of managing medicines. Um, I don't, I can see where that's frustrating for, for doctors and nurses. And someone else just put in the chat, also pharmacists will call the doctor and ask why they are on the opioid or judge when someone is taking them long-term. So yeah, there's a, there can be judgment and fear. Un unfortunately, the, um, I don't know, Allison, do you have any other thoughts on this? You watch the health system as a healthcare scholar and implementation scholar. Yeah, you know, I don't know the answer. I know that we see it and that we, you know, are very fortunate to work with pharmacists and um, nurses and physicians who, um, you know, feel very passionately about this. Uh, and, you know, that's why we're working with them. But yeah, um, yeah, it's a tough situation. Mm -hmm. I know there are patients now in the chats sharing some of their stories. So um, definitely keep us posted. I've also put a link to your podcast in the chat as well as the Medium post. And we will 100% be linking to that post from our website because I think that is a great resource. Without it, without a doubt. Definitely. And we could actually spend a, a, an hour and a half just on that issue. Yes. And how to talk to your doctor. Yes. Yeah. Any other questions, Jim? I I just I'm so thankful that you're here. And you know, Todd Hat Todd has um told us about you too. And and that's been really he's had a hard time in Minnesota. And so, you know, it's great what you're doing and continue. And I hope you get funding to go international because yes, I'd it, like to. Yeah. Well, thank you both for joining us. Uh, this was um, very informative and a great way to wrap up our 2023 virtual conference. Um, if you did just tune in, you of course can rewatch this on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. And please, please, please share this video and all the videos from this week so that anyone who may have missed them can um, check them out. And so, of course, you can watch them over and over and definitely, of course, send us a message or send us an email if you have any questions. Um, but you all know where to find us. Our email is info at rsds.org. Our website has so many different resources. If there's something that you cannot find, please let us know. We will help you find it and we can also create it for you. Um, you can also reach out to us if you need a new support group, if you're looking for a new physician, or if you want to tell your story on our blog. It is CRPS Awareness Month, aka November. So we're, you know, going to continue to share stories all month long. And of course, we do it all year long anyway, but we definitely want to make sure that we're sharing as many stories as we can this month. So thank you both for joining us. Thank you to everyone who's watching out there and have a great evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you.